Hey, Pond family, welcome back to the Pond Leaders Podcast. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to this episode of the podcast. And for those of you who are on the Facebook group, thank you so much for engaging and asking questions. And if you're not there, go to Facebook and type in the search bar, Pond Leaders Podcast Community. And that's where we talk about the episodes and questions that come up. And some of the guests are actually in there and they can answer your questions as well. So today with me, I have Dr. Wayne. Babovich, who practiced law for almost 40 years until retiring. He now teaches and lectures on a regular basis. Wayne has lectured in Europe, Canada, Australia, and throughout the United States. He holds a BA degree from Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, an MS degree, and a PhD in urban planning from the University of New Orleans, and a Jewish doctorate degree from the University of Houston. Man, that's a lot of studying, my friend. Dr. Babovich has published and lectured in the area of pawnbroking and worked in the pawn industry for over 30 years. He has lectured at numerous regional, state, and national pawn conventions. Dr. Babovich drafted the original legislation which formed the basis for the 1993 Louisiana Pawn Shop Act adopted by the Louisiana legislator. Wayne, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. And first of all, let me congratulate you. You've brought on some absolute all-stars on your pawn podcast. I listened to the podcast you did uh, with Tim Collier. Tim Collier is a gentleman, a scholar, has been part of the pawn industry and uh, a, a, a pillar in the rock for the pawn industry for very long. You brought on Tony Gallo, who when it comes to security, you just don't get any better. Great podcast. Uh, David Griffin with Money Laundering. I mean, he is the guru when it comes to money laundering. I'm, I'm honored that you'd even put me uh, on the same programs. I'm out of my league when you deal with the kind of, those kind of guys, but I really appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure and thank you for the kind words. I also agree we have some incredible leaders in this community and the goal of the podcast is to bring them on just like I'm bringing you on. So first of all, can we change it from podcast to podcast? It should be, right? It should be the Pond Leaders podcast. <laughs> I like that. Maybe I'll do that. I like that. So, you know, I, I, we were in a chat room somewhere on Facebook or, or LinkedIn, and I kept on seeing Law of Pawn. And so I went to your website, Law of Pawn. And then I said, wait a second, somebody wrote a book, you know, and I knew that I had to have you on the podcast, right? I had to bring you on to talk about the legal issues that pawnbrokers are going through today when it comes to things like ATF and Military Lending Act, and just in their local jurisdictions. And I want to start off with a story. And I don't know if I've told this story before, but I'll say it anyways. Uh, it was a Friday afternoon in the pawn shop, and all of a sudden, a detective walks in. And he asks to see an item. And so he said, sure, we'll get it out for you. Let, let me look through the, uh, the JUS 123 forms. And he said, no. I want to go inside your vault. So being in the California Palm Brokers Association, being a, a board member, I knew my rights. And I said, sir, I'm really sorry. Unless you have some type of a warrant or something, you can't come back into my vault. Within, I don't know, 45 seconds, Wayne, there were six sheriffs inside my store, guns drawn, requesting for them to go into the back area of our store to search every single item. I was steadfast. I was stubborn. I was saying, no, you don't know the law. There's no way I'm letting you back here. And in that moment, my brother grabbed me from behind. And he said, Egal, it's Friday afternoon. You're way too good looking to go to jail. If you go to jail, I can't bail you out till Monday. Let me figure this out. Go upstairs. So he sent me upstairs. I was pissed off. I was angry. I knew my rights. It ended up being that the person who was the victim was some big shot and the detective was trying to show off. And we took out some of the trays and we showed him some stuff and, and it worked out fine, but I was angry. So I'm sure that's happened to, to people who are listening to the show. And I'd love to start with just talking about our rights as pawnbrokers. Yeah, I, I want to share a story, too. Yeah, please. The Louisiana Pawn Brokers Association, oh, I guess it's 15 years ago, decided to do sort of a meet and greet around the state of Louisiana. We divided the state into, I think, six regions. Each of the regions, the Office of Financial Institutions, 
who is the regulatory body for pawnbrokers, local sheriffs, local police, local pawnbrokers. We got everybody together and we went through the Louisiana Pawn Shop Act, due process rights and so forth. It was a great meeting. Then an old crotchety sheriff who looked like something out of heat in heat of the night kind of leaned forward at the conference table and said, I'll show you the law of pawn in my district. And he pulls out his 45 and slams it on the table. And the district attorney is bending down. Uh, I think anywhere you go in America, you're, you're going to see those, those kinds of, of stories. And it, it goes to what I divide when I, when I give speeches, the daily challenges and what I call the landmines, the things that'll put you out of business. So, and the story you described and the story I've described are those daily challenges that are the most difficult. You've got to balance between, I know my rights, I'm going to go to jail on a Friday night, and let us reason together. If you get too nice, then they walk all over you. If you get too tough, we all know the terror stories. It, it's a real challenge. So let's start with, the, with your history in Pawn. How did you... Uh, get into the pawn industry and serve the pawn community? How did that begin? Gosh, almost 40 years ago, uh, a dear friend of mine was manager of one of the oldest pawn shops in Louisiana. And uh, he called me to help with an issue. Um, and I met a good number of pawn shops through that. And no one knew what the law was. There was no, because at that point, the law regulating pawn shops was all over our, our statutes. Uh, so I Xeroxed them and stapled the, together this compilation and passed it out. People loved it. They said, you know, you really ought to put it together as a little book. So I went to Kinko's and bound about 50 pages with cases and so forth. And that's what I called the first edition. Then we did a second edition, which was still simply bound, but had some commentaries. And then in 1993, when we passed the act, we really had to write something more serious uh, concerning pawn shops. Uh, and from 1993 to, I guess it was 19, 2016, the law, the, the information grew. And this is now, if, if you can see it. That's a big book. The Louisiana Law of Pawn. Uh, when we did that, so there's most people counted it as 18 federal laws that regulate pawn shops. And we covered all of those in the Louisiana book. So we did federal laws and it, it's staggering when you think about this, that there's this many federal laws regulating pawn shops. It wasn't that long ago that you had a pawn shop, you dealt with your local sheriff uh, and that was it. Uh, and you had a good relationship, hopefully, with him. Uh, and you didn't have to worry about anything else. Then Truth and Lending came along in uh, the 1960s. And boy, that really uh, put pawn shops on their ear. Then the Uniform Crime Control Act had uh, uh, ATF regulations and NICS. We all know and love that law. Graham Leach, Bliley, um, uh, the Military Lending Act the bankruptcy code, uh, it goes on and on. Uh, and you've, you've had, as I say, David on, uh, David uh, Giff, uh, Griffin dealing with um, uh, money laundering. Um, it's a whole new ball game. The day of mom and pop running a shop and, and not having to deal with, with uh, very much is long gone. And it's, Good and bad. And it's safe to say that if you're a pawnbroker, the excuse of I didn't know doesn't fly anymore because the fines and what could happen to your shop are much greater than getting your book or calling an attorney or just learning the local codes and the federal codes, correct? Absolutely. Um, I, in most cases, I didn't know uh, is not an excuse, whether it's driving down the interstate I didn't know the speed limit was 55, officer. I thought it was still 70. If it's 55, you're, you're going to be held responsible. And you can't tell ATF, I didn't know I needed to get the, the uh, model number on the gun or whatever. Uh, you can't tell uh, uh, Sinfin that 
well, a Federal Reserve, well, I didn't know how to calculate the annual interest rate. Those are the landmines and, and they will get you. Uh, local level, maybe you can early on uh, work with something, but uh, you're right. And it's, it's tough. It, it, so, it's, a co- it's a new cost of, of doing business. What are some of the, the biggest you know, issues that you've been seeing lately that people have been calling you about, messaging you about, that they're going through in their shops when it comes to like the federal level of regulation? On the federal level, uh, bankruptcy uh, is a real challenge. Bankruptcy attorneys do not have any concept whatsoever of uh, the rights of pawn shops uh, in the bankruptcy context. Basically, pledge items, pawned items, are immune from bankruptcy. Well, they don't understand that. Uh, They think you can have a wage earner plan um, and have the pawn shop paid for 10 years with no interest. Case law is replete, you can't do that. But pawn is so unusual in a bankruptcy uh, that bankruptcy attorneys don't know it. And of course, that's why in our book, we have a whole chapter which gives all those cases, how to fill out a form. uh, And uh, it's it's one of the real challenges for uh, pawn brokers that neither the courts nor the attorneys really understand uh, bankruptcy uh, and its relationship to pawn shops. So truth in lending, I think, is pretty much in place. Uh, if you have a software program, it's prop- probably uh, calculating it correctly. Uh, 90% of the uh, pawn shops I walk in don't have their Graham Leach Bliley notices sitting there. And um, uh, that can be a, 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 a real challenge if you're a big store. Let's, let's talk about the notice really quick. Let's go back. Um, explain what that is so that if people are listening and for some reason don't know what that is, explain what that notice is and why it's important to have it in your store. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit longer history. After the stock market crash, banks were prohibited from remaining in ancillary businesses that kind of wrapped everything together. Uh, Before the Depression, a bank could be an insurance company and a a lender and a a health insurance, a whole litany of things. Um, Then the uh, law changed in uh, the 90s and allowed banks to begin doing ancillary services again. One of the things they did uh, as a, a... a trade-off was to say that annually all lenders, all financial institutions is the term, all financial institutions have to notify borrowers that their information is private, that it cannot be sold to an insurance company or a stockbroker or whomever without the customer's approval. They have to give a written, written notice of that. Uh, Graham Leach Bliley was the act that did that. Well, I, I say when I talk to pawn groups that, you know, when they go to the the uh, meeting at the at their kid's school or uh, at the church, they can proudly say the federal deter- federal government has determined that I own a financial institution because pawn shops are financial yeah. institutions. Uh, so they have to give on an annual basis to their borrowers, the Graham Leach Bliley notice. Um, I don't know of a local pawn shop uh, who's been held responsible. Uh, And the major nationals, I think, invariably do a good job of providing it. But um, I tell my clients, you put that stack of notices at your, at your, your, your window and you make sure everybody gets one. You do not ask them to sign for it. Because if you have everybody's signature but one and they say they didn't get it, then if, if you have everybody else's signature and you don't have theirs, you've proved their case. Gotcha. So I tell them to put it there, you make sure you give it to them, but you don't require they sign. What's another area that pawnbrokers <clears throat> always kind of stay in the gray area when, where there's a law, but they come to you and they say, well, I don't agree with it, but they're always kind of miss out on being responsible for this. What's, what is that? Income taxes. No, no, I, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. 
didn't say that. Uh, that's a, that's a, I've never, ever, it's kind of hard to come up with a question I haven't heard before. But you know, that's, that's, that's a very good one. I would say the Soldiers and Sailors Relief Act. Soldiers and Sailors Relief Act goes back to the Civil War, when if a soldier was fighting in the Civil War, World War I, World War II, and they were on active duty, you couldn't foreclose on a house uh, or whatever. Uh, it was inequitable. Uh, they didn't get notice. They didn't get due process. Soldiers and Sailors Relief Act is, is, is still there. Um, when we were writing the last version of the book, uh, we asked two colonels high up in the Judge Advocate General Corps the process that pawnbrokers should follow. They both said, we have no idea. We have no clue what you should do. And so we footnoted that and <laughs> cited the colonels. I said, may I use your name? And they said, yes, I could. Uh, I, I've seen a couple of cases with... Um, uh, uh, rent to own. I've seen a couple of cases with payday loans. I've never seen a case with a pawn shop where they've been popped by the uh, Soldiers and Sailors Relief Act. Now we have the Military Lending Act. Yes. And that's still really floating. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure where that's going to come down. Uh, you know, we, we've seen some interesting things. Obviously, if a pawnbroker can only charge 36%, he can loan less money. Well, these we military know that if they don't say they're military, then they're going to get a higher loan. So they don't tell you. Uh, and if they're dependents, they don't potentially show up on the, on the um, um, uh, check. So uh, I don't know where that's going to come down uh, as, as we go forward on the MLA. That's a great question. I've never heard that question before. Thank you. So it's, it's still a gray area, right, where we're supposed to be abiding by the Military Lending Act. But as pawnbrokers, there isn't clear definition, like you said, from the colonels or from the government to say, this is how you have to verify or this is what you need to do to figure out who the dependents are and all that type of stuff. Is that correct? We, uh, I may have to tell you a story a bit. You said you're a member of the California Association. Uh, John Webster is the president. Um, I mean, the attorney. The attorney. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that, John. Uh, of, for the association, uh, they filed suit under the MLA. The National Pawnbrokers filed suit uh, under the MLA. The NPA filed in Washington, D.C. California filed in California. Same attorneys for the government in both cases. In the two cases, they defined, the government defined what was a safe harbor differently. Wow. Same attorneys. Same attorneys, two different federal judges, two different answers. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's great for the federal government as far as where the safe harbor really is. Um, on on that, uh, but the MLA is going to uh, be around for a while, with the Trump administration not funding uh, the Consumer uh, uh, Protection Bureau. Uh, how much effort there's going to be to to enforce it? I, I don't know. Whether the JAG Corps uh, will enforce it, no one knows yet. Yeah. It is uh, it is open. So as we're doing business as pawnbrokers, obviously the Military Lending Act is important. And we're supposed to ask if they're in the military and charge them less interest. And, you know, the, you talked about the soldiers and sailors where you're not supposed to foreclose, but you don't know who's on active duty. I mean, it, it's a lot of. And it deals that, with dependents. So you can't run the dependence number. And then you have people using a straw man for military lending act yeah. loans yeah. like you do with, with the ATF. So. Uh, Life's not simple, unfortunately. So as the pawnbroker, as the pawn shop owner, what do you suggest we do to be able to steer away from the landmines, knowing that there's a lot of gray areas, there is different definitions of the law? What's the best way for us to be able to proceed so we can go to sleep, put our head on our pillow, and not have anxiety? Great question belong to the NPA. Uh, they're there for everybody. They need everybody's support. As is typical, 10% of the people do the heavy lifting for everybody. 
uh, and it's a great source. The conventions have a great, great number of seminars. Belong to your local pawnbrokers association. Uh, three, uh, act in good faith. You know, if, if you get in trouble, but it's obvious that it's an honest mistake, if it's obvious that you were trying to follow the law, you're 100% off, uh, uh, better off. So act in good faith. Um, keep a record. Build your, your paper trail. Drives me insane when ATF comes down on somebody and they can they could get anybody they want on a violation. It is impossible to be perfect. But um, if you have training, if you have procedures, and it becomes obvious that you follow that training, you do in fact train people, if you do follow your procedures and you make a mistake, then the ATF's going to say, well, you did everything you could. Craig Toys is a, a pawnbroker in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. I think he's a third generation pawnbroker. He had the best manuals for training, for procedures that I saw anywhere. And I asked Craig, Craig, can I put it in my book? He said, yes. Oh, typical, nice. Typical pawnbroker. He could have said, absolutely not. I don't want my competitors to have this. Not Craig. He was typical good pawnbroker. He said, I'm honored. And uh, he allowed us to use those to set all those out. And uh, they're like the garlic in front of the vampire, I like to say. <laughs> when the ATF sees you really doing it right, you're halfway home. Because, boy, I tell you what, an ATF prosecution is worse than a root canal. Well, let's talk about ATF, especially with what's happening uh, in the government today, in our nation today, with gun control. I live in California, a very democratic state. Uh, nobody likes guns. Most of our listeners are in Texas and, and in the South where they have stores with guns and things like that. What do you think or where is the nature of ATF at this moment? Where do you think it's going to go? And as a palm broker, apart from just keeping my books straight and the paperwork straight, what do I do with all this you know, societal backlash when it comes to ATF and, and gun control? Well, th there again, a great, great and terrifically timely question. Uh, there was a case, I want to say it was in Minneapolis, where one shop, and it wasn't a pawn shop, accounted for something like 13% of the guns used uh, to shoot policemen. Wow. Now, and they had a multi-million dollar jury verdict against them. And it was egregious. Uh, it, was, it appears from a distance from the newspaper articles and the jurisprudence, it was appropriate. Um, and now, uh, with all of the, the marches we just saw with the anti-gun uh, situation, I think we're going to see more and, and more of that. Our Louisiana legislature is in session right now. I like to say the inmates are running the asylum. <laughs> there, are, there are 32 bills dealing with regulating firearms. Wow. Now, I would bet none will pass. This is Louisiana. We're very conservative. We're a Republican state. The, N, uh, the NRA is very strong. But I think it indicates, on, on the one hand, the, uh, the public attitude toward firearms and the regulation of firearms. And if they can make a scapegoat of a pawn shop, they're going to do it. The last thing you want to see is headline, pawnbroker sells gun to school murderer. You know, doesn't matter. Pawnbroker filing all the laws. Pawnbroker did everything he was supposed to. That'll be the headline. Yeah. So on the one hand, we see that, that activity. On the other, the Trump administration, after saying they were anti-gun, is following the NRA line. And I, and I think you're not going to see, under the Trump administration, the ATF going o overboard. Where it will end, I'm getting ready to speak at the uh, Dixie Convention. I'll be there. I'll see you there. Very good. Yeah. Um, are you buying? Am I what? Buying. I'm speaking. At the, at the bar. Oh, I'll buy you a drink. Yeah, for sure. It's here, folks. You saw it. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm going to be talking about the, uh, uh, the challenges we're going to be facing uh, 
with firearms. I really don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. I know it's going to really be, you know, the old line is all, all politics are local. And that's, that, there's a lot of merit to that. And I think with gun control, all gun control is going to be local. What you guys out in California do will be very different than um, um, what we do. You just got to kind of compare Barbara Streisand to James Carville and you. And I like what you said, you know, it's as long as you act in good faith and you're training your employees, you're keeping a paper trail and the government comes down and says, hey, well, at least you did this. You know, we're human. We can screw up. I think the issue is when a pawn shop isn't diligent and they just don't care. And that's why we have the podcast, right? I mean, we want the industry to become better leaders and better uh, businesses in the communities. So if you're out there listening, make sure, and if you're selling guns, especially, make sure you're doing your due diligence, make sure you're training your employees extensively, make sure that you're acting in good faith. And if you don't know something, you know, give Wayne a call and we'll, we'll get you to the number at the end of the show. I appreciate the commercial. You know, what do you do? Someone comes in and pawns a firearm. They can certainly do that. They go to take it out. You got to run the next check. They, it, it hangs. You've got a gun sitting there. You don't own it, even though you loaned money on it. You can't give it back to them, but you can't get rid of it. When you ask the ATF, what do I do with that gun that's in Never Never Land? I've gotten the same answer from a dozen ATF people. Beats the hell out of me. Yeah. I mean, uh, but you just act with common sense uh, with uh, uh, what, what do you want to see on the front page of the paper? Uh, we had a pawnbroker in Louisiana. He called me up. He said, I think you got a problem. Dear friend of mine was on the board of trustees of my church. His son came to me. I sold him a gun. I didn't wait the three days because I knew it was a fine family. And he went out and shot his wife. Do I have a Shoot. problem? <laughs> you better follow the rules and, and use some good common sense. Yeah, so pawnbrokers listening, follow the rules. I know that we've, we've been in an industry, Wayne, where I was growing up. I know my father, my uncle, they came into rules. I remember the moment growing up as a kid where in California, you had to start describing all the items in depth. And you have to start separating each and every ticket with each and every item. And before it was like the wild, wild west, right? That's what some pawnbrokers say. It's a different ball game today. Absolutely. Stop. If you keep doing business the way you were doing it 40 years ago. You're, you're in not, big trouble. You're going to be in trouble. Big if you trouble. keep doing business the way your grandfather did it, even the way your father did it when it comes to law, you might be in trouble. So be careful. And the sad part of it is there's a little tiny pawn shop in, in New Orleans, downtown, Mr. Solly and his wife, mom and pop, only people in the shop, tiny little place. I'm in there talking to him. A guy walks in. He's Mr. He says, Mr. Solly, can I borrow $20 like usual on my watch? He says, of course. He says, can I have the $20 today and bring the watch in tomorrow? And he said, sure. And he gave him the $20. I'm not sure today how you would handle that on leads online. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it was a night it was a it was a better way to operate in in many ways but uh, that's not the world we live in sadly uh, i've had several pawnbrokers particularly out in your area who said our policy was we did not charge interest to military if the military came in and wanted to pawn his watch for 50 dollars, we didn't charge him a dime of interest now with the mla we're charging them the 36 percent we almost yeah. have to yeah. so uh they, they uh, you know we all hear the terror stories and so forth but nobody wants to hear the uh, the good i used to have a presentation that i gave where uh the title of it i think was like you live upstairs from your store because back in the early 1900s, people lived upstairs and the pawn shop was downstairs. Yeah. The pawnbroker's kids and the, the customer's kids all played ball together. They all went to the same church um, and they treated their, their customers like that. And I had a series of film clips of, of 
movies where pawnbrokers were. An old Char Charlie Chaplin movie. And the very first movie, it was a silent movie um, from about 1905, I think, where the pawnbroker's the hero. He saves the little, the little girl comes in to pawn her doll for her mother's medicine. And the pawnbroker yeah. takes the doll, gives her the medicine, and people go, ugh. Pawnbroker brings the doll back, brings furniture back, brings the doctor back. He's the hero. He lived upstairs from yeah. the Well, now, nowadays, the pawnbroker's fat, uh, sitting behind bars, smoking a cigar, and is a disgruntled uh, business owner in the movies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you go in, you see um, uh, the one with the aliens. I can't Men in think. Black. Men in Black. The pawnbroker's yeah. really an alien. Yeah, and uh, of course Rod Steiger in the in the pawnbroker in the Crow, which is a very dark movie. And now you look at these movies and pawnbrokers are, are the bad guy. We've got a challenge in our industry, and yeah. frankly, I think you're doing the type of thing that needs to be done to help turn that. When you bring a Tim Collier, who is as class a guy as you're going to get, his only fault is he's an Arkansas fan, <laughs> um, and, and Tony Gallo, who knows security, and, and yeah. David Griffin, you know, those, bringing those to people as you're doing is a tremendous service to the industry, and I really appreciate it, and uh, I'm going to let them know that I'm moving up to their class. You know, nice. So. Well, they did mention you, so, but, you know, I think it's important, as pawnbrokers, we have to continuously be learning, and we're not seen as an industry that's as popular as it used to be, right? With all the pawn shows out there and everybody still thinks it's a great business, but it's hard to be a pawnbroker. All the laws, all the legalities, all the paperwork, uh, the retail scenarios at the moment with what's happening online. And I want pawnbrokers to know, even though this is a show about law, this episode, don't be afraid. You know, don't stress about it. Just learn about it. And the more you know, Obviously, like back in the day, that the TV commercial, the more you know with the star shooting across, it's important. You have to know the laws. You have to know your rights. In San Diego, we kept on battling with the police department, and, and John came to the rescue many times because they would just step out of bounds. And, and I don't blame them. They just didn't know the law, and they thought they did. Pawn yeah. broke, uh, police don't equate. They would never go on a car lot and pick up a car where there was a loan with, without due process. No yeah. one would think about going into a bank and, and just seizing somebody's bank account without due process. But they'll go in a pawn shop and pick up that camera, that watch or whatever. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's, it's constantly an education uh, process that, that we have to do. Um, and uh, yeah. the rights are there for us. We've just gotta well, handle them gently. Quickly, and I ask almost every guest this who's in the industry, I want you to tell me the three biggest mistakes pawnbrokers are making at the moment when it comes to the law that you've seen. Three biggest mistakes, just quickly. They don't develop carefully a relationship with their community when no. they can. The LPBA just donated all the instruments to a very poor public school who couldn't march in Mardi Gras. Wow. And they donated all the instruments. I mean probably $50,000 of instruments wow. and then had the local Senator and state representative be the ones who actually handed them over. So they love us and they help us in the legislature. So they don't want to go to the legislature uh, and to, to their legislators, to the public, unless it's a problem. We got to be the pawnbroker who lives upstairs. Uh, number two, they don't build the paper trail uh, and have their records. So they did their ATF. Uh, homework or whatever. Uh, and then I guess uh, number three, they don't join their local association in the M NPA and keep on top of things. So just to repeat those, because I love it. They're not being, you know, a pillar of the community, connecting with the community, which I they're think- not aggressively they working to develop the bridges that they eventually are going to need. Yeah. Two, they're not keeping paper trails the way they need to. And three, not joining a state or the NPA, which essentially is, is fighting for all of us, right? Sometimes you disagree with it. Sometimes you agree with it. At the end of the day, get involved, know the law so that you can sleep well at night. Wayne, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. Do it again uh, next time when you're doing summer reruns or whatever. 
uh, I'm available again. And I For look sure. forward to you buying me a drink at the Dixie. Done. It's done. And uh, if you want to find Wayne, go to lawofpawn.com. Pick up the book. Uh, also, you can give him a call. He's been kind enough to, uh, to give us his phone number, which is 504-283-9353. And to my Pawn family, thank you so much for listening. Once again, join us in the Pawn Leaders Podcast community and stay tuned for the next episode of the Pawn Leaders Podcast.